Our gracious Father, we thank you so much for your calling. We thank you for your tremendous mercy and compassion and grace upon us as your children. We come to you this evening so thankful for your word, your word of truth that encourages us, that inspires us, that gives us a reason to carry on the way of life that you've called us to, to be disciples, to be followers of your son, Jesus, worshipers of you, Father God. So we just ask you to bless the study tonight. Help us to understand how we calculate the days leading up to the day of Pentecost. Open our hearts and minds to understand your word. Help us, Father, to make the complex simple and to make these things easy to grasp and understand so that we can teach others. And we thank you for this Bible study. We ask you to bless it, the speaking and the hearing, and guide us in all that is said and done. And we pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. All right, everyone. Well, thank you so much for joining us for the study tonight. And the Bible study is counting to Pentecost. As you know, we are in the midst of between the days of unleavened bread and the day of Pentecost. And this is a question that often comes up, how we count the 50 days to the day of Pentecost. So I thought it was quite appropriate for this Bible study to discuss this at uh, this point in time. Counting the days to Pentecost can be very controversial. There are all kinds of ideas, all kinds of opinions, People look at different scriptures, they quote from different scriptures, and this Bible study is not intended to cast judgment on those who count the days of Pentecost differently than we do. They can explain themselves. My job is to explain the reasons why the United Church of God counts the days of Pentecost the way that we do. So again, I'm not cry trying to be negative or critical of others in the way they do it. What I am trying to do is outline and help us all to understand more deeply and clearly how and why we count the days to Pentecost as we do. It's a very important holy day. It was on this day of Pentecost that the New Testament church was founded. And it's mentioned in Acts chapter two, verses one through three. The name of the festival is derived from the Greek New Testament word for 50th, Pericoste, or Pentecoste, meaning 50th, and it comes directly from Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. It says, when the day of Pentecost, again, that's Pentecoste, had fully come, they were all with one accord and one place. So that's why, rather than using Hebrew expressions, we tend to use the Greek expression of Pentecost. It's a term, it's a translation of the Hebrew expression, the festival of 50 days or the Feast of Weeks, which is mentioned in the Old Testament. It refers to the fact that Pentecost was on the 50th day in a specific counting commanded in the Old Testament. We'll look at those scriptures in just a few minutes. The festival is one of the seven annual holy days listed in Leviticus 23. When we go back to the Old Testament now, we see that the same festival was also referred to as the Feast of Harvest, the first fruits of your labor. That's in Exodus chapter 23 and verse 16. It's also referred to as the Feast of Weeks. Uh, the Hebrew word for that, uh, sometimes also people call it Shavuot. Um, it referred to this Hebrew word in Exodus chapter 34 and verse 22, Deuteronomy chapter 16, verses 10 and 16. The use of the term Feast of Weeks makes reference to the time period between the days of unleavened bread and Pentecost. Certain weeks, seven complete weeks, were to be counted. And the implication of counting a number of days or weeks is clear by the very name of the festival something that you call the Feast of Weeks, you're obviously going to be counting weeks in order for it to happen. Okay, let's go to the next slide here. So we're gonna to go to Leviticus chapter 23 and look at verses 15 and 16 very closely. We wanna look at them in closer detail so we can better understand these verses and comprehend exactly what they're saying. Uh, excuse me while I have a little cough here. Uh, 
Thank you. My uh, allergies have been uh, kicking up, so that's been a struggle for me the last few days. But Leviticus chapter 23, verses 15 through 16, it says, And you shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be completed. Count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath, then you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. Now, those are verses 15 and 16. So now we're going to break it down into phrases and take a closer look at what these verses can tell us. It begins with the day after the Sabbath. It's what we call Sunday in the Gregorian calendar, the first day of the week. We will later see that the Sadducees and the Pharisees differed on what this Sabbath was. You'll notice it says the day after the Sabbath. So was it referring to the weekly Sabbath? Or was it referring to an annual Sabbath, like the first day of unleavened bread? The Sadducees and the Pharisees had a different opinion on what this Sabbath was. So let's continue. And you shall count for yourself from the day after the Sabbath, from the day you brought the sheaf of the wave offering. This was a temple ceremony. It wasn't something that it was done publicly for the entire community to see or witness. It was something that was done in the temple later on after the temple was built, obviously in the tabernacle beforehand. Ancient Israel was not allowed to eat any of the new barley grain harvest until the commanded wave sheaf offering was presented. Then the harvest could begin, and it always be began with barley. That was the first uh, grain that would ripen. And then as that harvest was petering out, the wheat harvest would begin. They would continue to harvest the wheat. And 50 days later, a wheat offering of two loaves was given and presented at that time for the day of Pentecost. So let's continue our examination of these verses 15 and 16. The day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, additional commentary on that, uh, this picture, Jesus Christ ascending to the Father to be formally accepted as the first to be raised from the dead in God's spiritual harvest of humanity. And he told Mary Magdalene on that very morning in 31 AD, not to touch him or not to cling to him because he needed to ascend to the Father and be accepted. So Jesus Christ was the fulfillment of this wave sheaf offering that was made on this particular Sabbath. Continuing, seven Sabbaths shall be completed. So there were to be in this counting seven complete Sabbaths, but there's an additional day added beyond the 49 days, as we'll see in the next statement. So that's how we get to 50. We get to the 49 days for seven complete Sabbaths, and then we have an additional day. So the next phraseology in these verses is count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath, then you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. Count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath again, this is what we today would call Sunday or the first day of the week in the Gregorian calendar. And this actually gives us a summation of what this counting is. You are to count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. So if you understand that the Sabbath is a weekly Sabbath, then you know it's this day that you're looking forward to this day of weeks or this Feast of Pentecost is the day after a Sabbath. It's actually very clear in these verses. So then it says, then you will offer a new grain offering. The, the count was to conclude on the 50th day on which an offering was presented of two loaves of bread cakes from the first fruits of the wheat harvest. This time it was the wheat harvest, it was completed and this 50th day is thus identified in the New Testament as the Feast of Pentecost. So that's a closer examination of those verses. One of the first things that we have to discuss that was a bone of detention between the Sadducees and the Pharisees is 
the Sabbath referred to here, which is actually referred to three times in these two verses, is it referring to a weekly Sabbath or an annual Sabbath, the holy day, in this case, the first day of unleavened bread? Or as some say, the seventh day of unleavened bread? Well, I think we have to look at context. So let's go ahead and begin looking at the Hebrew word for Sabbath in these verses. And you shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, that's the Hebrew word Shabbat, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths, again, that's the Hebrew word Shabbat, plural, same, same Hebrew word though, shall be completed. Count 50 days to the day after the seventh Shabbat, then you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. So you see in these two verses, three times the word that's translated into English Sabbath is the Hebrew word Shabbat. And why is that important? Well, it's really important because if you go all the way back to verse three, the beginning of Levit Leviticus chapter 23, you will see that the very first festival actually mentioned is the weekly Sabbath day. It says in verse three, the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, continuing it would say a holy convocation. That happens to be the same exact Hebrew word, Shabbat, referring to the weekly Sabbath as is used in verse 15, where it says the day after the Sabbath. Verse 15 again, seven Sabbaths, Shabbat, shall be completed. Verse 16, the day after the seventh, Shabbat. So in every case, the weekly Sabbath is what is referred to. We have to be consistent. We can't pick and choose. And the scriptures consistently tell us here in Leviticus 23, that this Hebrew word refers to the weekly Sabbath. So we have to be consistent. Either all four of these verses refer to a weekly Sabbath or none of them refers to the weekly Sabbath. It's very clear in verse three that in Leviticus 23, the very first festival that is mentioned is indeed the weekly Sabbath. Again, the same Hebrew word, that's used in these verses we just took a look at in verses 15 and 16. And it's very important for us to understand as we realize the differences between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. The Sadducees believed and taught that the day after the Sabbath was the weekly Sabbath. They controlled the temple services. So they decided when all of these activities in the temple including the wave sheaf offerings were going to occur. From their perspective, they said that the Torah, and remember the only thing they accepted was the book of Moses. That's the only thing the Sadducees, Sadducees accepted as holy scripture was the Torah, first four books of Moses. They said, look, it clearly states in verse 16, count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath, Sabbath then you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. They said, that's clear. That, that, that's the words, that's the teaching. You count seven Sabbaths and it's the day after that seventh Sabbath, which we would call Sunday today or the first day of the week. And that is what the scriptures clearly delineate in the Torah. So this would be again, the first day of the week or what we call Sunday. The Sadducees would have rejected any of the Pharisees oral traditions or uh, opinions or beliefs. The Sadducees said, if it's not in the Torah, if it's not clearly written in the Torah, we don't just accept tradition, opinions and ideas and what some rabbi said 300 years ago. It's got to be in the Torah to be important. So that was the position of the Sadducees. Now the United Church of God agrees that um, the, these, this word, this Hebrew word Shabbat is also a reference to the weekly Sabbath, just so we understand that. In contrast, the Pharisees believed and taught that the day after the Sabbath was the festival day of unleavened bread itself, an annual Sabbath. So when they read this, they interpreted 
the day after the Sabbath there in verse 15 to be the first day of unleavened bread. Some others would would believe that it was the seventh day of unleavened bread, but that it was also an annual Sabbath, not a weekly Sabbath. Therefore, 50 days later is Sivan 6, if counting from the first day of unleavened bread, or Sivan 12, Sivan is the third month in the Hebrew calendar, or Sivan 12, if counting from the seventh day of unleavened bread. So as you can see, the Sadducees and the Pharisees were in disagreement. This was one of a number of issues in which they disagreed with each other. So putting that together, there really are four major options to count the days of Pentecost. The four major ones, there's a large number of ones, but I'm not going to go into uh, some that, you know, very small opinions or groups would do. You know how Christians are, brethren. If there are five ways to do something, uh, religious people will create six. Uh, that's just the, the nature of people being religious. So aside from the, the little tangents, there are four major options to count the days to Pentecost, what we would call the Feast of Weeks. So let's take a look at them quickly. The first one is Savan 6, or a fixed date for Pentecost. The actual day of Pentecost can fall through this methodology in virtually any day of the week according to this scenario. Sylvan 6 is 50 days after Nisan 16th. The necessity for counting is eliminated by this approach. You, but by beginning the count on a fixed day of the month, you will always arrive at a fixed day for the festival. So if you always count from Nisan 16th, the day after the first day of unleavened bread, you will always arrive at Sivan 6, which is a fixed date for the festival on the calendar, a fixed calendar date, though it can be a different day of the week. This is actually the method used by modern Judaism. This was the method of the Pharisees. You may recall that after the temple was destroyed around 70 AD, that this Sadducees won the theological debate of who was going to control, uh, I'm sorry, the Pharisees won the theological debate and who was going to control Judaism. The Sadducees all lost their jobs. There was no longer a temple. There was nothing for them to do. They had to get in other careers. But it was the Pharisees who became the leaders of what was left of Judaism and had great influence on modern Judaism today. All right, here's the second option. Savan 12, or a fixed date for Pentecost. Savan 12 is the 50th day, if you begin counting, on the San 22nd, the day immediately following the last day of unleavened bread. The same statement can be made here as was made earlier. The necessity for counting is eliminated by beginning the count on a fixed date. If you start out on a fixed date, you'll always end up on a fixed date. So if you start out in the San 22, count 50, you'll always end up in Savan 12, even though it may be different days of the week. So that's the second option. Option number three, a Monday Pentecost. That's 50 days from the Sunday during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This is the result of what's called exclusive counting, beginning the count on Monday is day one, excluding the Sunday of the wave sheaf. Now, this is what the Radio Church of God and the Worldwide Church of God observed and did until the early 1970s. And I was in the church at the time when this change occurred. It was changed in uh, 1974. But there are, are a number of offshoots if I can use that phrase, of the Radio Church of God originally and the Worldwide Church of God who still observe a Monday Pentecost using this methodology. And then the fourth major option is a Sunday Pentecost, 50 days from the Sunday during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. 50 days are counted and Pentecost is celebrated on the 50th day, which will always be on a Sunday. Might be a different calendar day. It's not a fixed day in that it might be on a different calendar day every year, but it will always be on a Sunday. 
This is the method used by the United Church of God and some other Church of God groups who observe Pentecost. So now let's review these four options from the context of scripture and reasoning and come to an understanding of why the United Church of God does what we do, why we believe what we believe. All right, here's option number one again. It's Savan 6 or a fixed date for Pentecost. So the actual day of Pentecost can fall again on virtually any day of the week according to this scenario. Savan 6 is 50 days after Nisan 16th. The necessity for counting is eliminated by this approach. By beginning the count on a fixed day of the month, you will arrive at a fixed date for the festival. Consistently, you'll arrive at Savan 6 if you do that. And again, in the time of Jesus, the Pharisees observed the Feast of Weeks this way. The Sadducees did not. And after 70 AD and the destruction of the temple, the Pharisees became the sole leaders of Judaism. Their view prevailed and it still prevails within Judaism today. Some say with this option one, that the Jews should know. And after all, they won. They have authority because they came to dominate Judaism. Well, rationally, to me, that's like saying the Catholic Church should know about Christianity and have authority because they came to dominate Christianity. So they should know. They should be the arbiter of truth. Well, domination of a faith doesn't make one right. The question should be, what do the scriptures say, not who won, because in history, whoever wins gets to write the history, but that doesn't necessarily make them correct. That doesn't make them right. That just makes them the ones who won. So to me, that kind of reasoning just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But here, here's something that does make a lot of sense that I think many people who cling to a fixed date don't appreciate. Here it is. If it always will fall on Savan 6, why would God provide a complicated 50-day counting method? Here are other examples of proclaimed fixed dates in Leviticus 23. God said in verse 5, on the 14th day of the first month, that's clear, you don't need any counting. On the first month, 14th day, Bingo, there you are, you can observe it. Verse six, on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. No complicated how many weeks have to go by, how many Sabbaths have to be completed. Very upfront, clear, simple to understand. Verse 24, in the seventh month, on the first day of the month. Verse 27, referring to atonement, also the 10th day of the seventh month. Verse 34, the 15th day of the seventh month, referring to the Feast of Tabernacles. So as you can see, there are examples of proclaimed fixed dates in Leviticus 23. And when God wants to give instruction on how to observe a fixed date, doesn't require complicated counting, it can be stated very clearly. God is not the author of confusion. Of course, that scripture comes from uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 33. Excuse me for a second. So God is not the author of confusion. He could have easily said on the sixth day of the third month, remember the third month is Savan, on the sixth day of the third month shall be the wave offering. But he doesn't say that. Instead, he provides a counting method that can be frankly very confusing. So confusing, many religious people do it differently. So why didn't he make it simple for a fixed date, like saying on the sixth day of the third month, or if he meant the 50 days from the seventh day of unleavened bread, on the 12th day of the third month shall be a wave sheaf offering. But he doesn't say that, why? Well, one can only come to a reasonable conclusion that having a consistent fixed date was not his intention. So that's the problem with option one. 
you have to define the Sabbath as an annual Sabbath, not a weekly Sabbath. And you have to answer the question why, if it is on the same fixed date, God didn't give a simple instruction like he does in so many areas of Levit Leviticus 23 on how to observe a fixed date. Let's take a look at option number two. Option number two, the same holds true for this option as we looked at on option number one. Savan 12 or um, is also a fixed date for Pentecost. It's the 50th day if you begin counting from the last day of unleavened bread or Nisan 22. And again, God is not the author of confusion. He could have said on the 12th day of the third month shall be the wave offering. But again, like we looked at earlier in this option, he doesn't say that, or the previous option, he doesn't say that. One can only come to a reasonable conclusion that having a fixed date was not his will, and that's why he provided the counting system that he does. Option number three, a Monday Pentecost. Again, that's 50 days from the Sunday during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, this is the result of exclusive counting, beginning the count on Monday as day one, excluding the Sunday of the wave sheep. So you don't include Sunday when you start counting, you begin counting on Monday. So this difficulty was brought about by a misinterpretation of a word that was translated from Hebrew and English. And the English word is from. And in English, oftentimes, when you use the word from when you're counting, you are excluding the day that you're counting from. But that is not the way the Hebrew word works. Frankly, my research tells me, and I've done a fair amount of research on the internet and tried to find uh, various groups, it tells me that only groups or churches that hold of this view descended from the Radio Church of God or the early days of the Worldwide Church of God. The reason is that anyone who studies Hebrew understands the Hebrew word used here always implies inclusive counting. That's just the nature of Hebrew. It's a different culture, a different thought, and it's always inclusive in counting, meaning you begin to count on Sunday. It's not exclusive where you skip Sunday as your first day and you begin counting on Monday. Herbert Armstrong came to understand this himself in 1974 after he talked to a few Jewish scholars and uh, Hebrew Bible translators. I'm going to give some um, quotes here in a minute of some of the things that he said at the time the change was made. And it all comes as a response to a Hebrew expression, ma mahorat, translated into English into from. And in Hebrew, it's inclusive. It means beginning to count on the day after the Sabbath. And this would be inclusive and not exclusive reckoning. So again, there's a difference between Hebrew thought and Hebrew expressions and sometimes when they are translated into English and the way that we do in our culture. Therefore, day one is the Sunday after the Sabbath during the days of unleavened bread, and day 50 is also a Sunday. So again, that's what happens when you're using inclusive counting rather than what Mr. Armstrong originally did using exclusive counting. Here's some things that he said. This comes from his notes in 1974, in which he introduced a Pentecost to study uh, material. And I'd like to just shed a little light on how he came to understand this himself. Quote, the Pentecost question is one that can be made very complex and complicated. Also, it can, and I feel should be made quite simple to simplify it. I do not like to say the issue is whether we count 50 days from a Sunday inclusively or exclusively in English. 50 days from a Sunday can be counted no other way than that one day from Sunday is Monday and 50 days from Sunday always falls on a Monday. The crux of the matter is the statement, but when it, the Hebrew, my 
or min is translated as from instead of on and used in conjunction with the element of time, it is always used inclusively and never exclusively. Now, of course, this study paper went into far more detail about this Hebrew word and, and what it meant and proved that it's always used inclusively. That was within the study material. This was simply Mr. Armstrong's introduction to it. One other segment that he wrote, this being true, that is in the Hebrew, when in relation to time, it should never be translated into the English from, but beginning on. So Mr. Armstrong was saying that the translation was poor to use that Hebrew word and translate it into English from, but a better way of translating into English would have been use the phraseology beginning on. Continuing what he says here, quote, it is the fact that one of the translators of the RSV, that's the Revised Standard Version, who is chairman of the Revision Committee, now revising the RSV, said not only that, but that he will strongly recommend the revision will so translate it that caused me to change the Passover or caused me to change the Pentecost from Monday to Sunday. In English, 50 days from a Sunday is always a Monday. But when I learned that two of the actual translators confirmed this as above, and I found the English from to be misleading, I changed it immediately. So again, this was the, um, the comments from Herbert Armstrong in 1974 as an introduction to the study material. So that was option three, Pentecost on a Monday. Option four is a Sunday Pentecost, 50 days from the Sunday during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. 50 days are counted and Pentecost is celebrated on the 50th day, which will always be on a Sunday. Might be on a different calendar day of the month, but it will always be on a Sunday. And this is the teaching that we support and observe in the United Church of God. So a Sunday Pentecost, 50 days from the Sunday counting, beginning 50 days from the Sunday during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, as the 50 days are counted and Pentecost is celebrated on the 50th day, it will always be on a Sunday. And here are some of the, the reasoning and just consolidating some of the things that I've mentioned tonight. First of all, Leviticus chapter 23, verse 15. It says the day after the Sabbath, we are consistent with the same Hebrew word that is translated for Sabbath in verse three, which is obviously talking about the weekly Sabbath, no debate or discussion about that. And also the same Hebrew word is used in verses 15 and 16. And we are consistent and we believe in all cases that word Sabbath refers to the weekly Sabbath, not a high day, not an annual Sabbath. So that's something that I wanted to reiterate. Verse 16, it says, count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. We believe like the Sadducees did, this is actually very clear. If you just read it for what it says, it says the day after the seventh weekly Sabbath is the day of Pentecost. And again, that will always be on a day that we call today Sunday. And I wish it had a different name, but we call it Sunday, the first day of the week. And that will always occur if we are understanding what it says here in verse 16, what the instruction is. We do not accept a fixed date of Savan 6 or 12th because we count from the weekly Sabbath during the days of unleavened bread, not from the first holy day or the seventh holy day. However, in some years it may happen to fall by coincidence on Savant 6, and that's okay. God could have clearly distinguished these as fixed days when he made the instruction for when the day of Pentecost would occur, he could have used the same reasoning, the same phraseology as he did for so many actually fixed days in Leviticus 23. But he presented a counting method instead. And he presented that counting method for a reason. 
And that is because they are not consistently, the Pentecost is not consistently on a fixed calendar day. Yes, it's on the same day of the week, Sunday, but it is can be on different monthly days. The date of Pentecost would not be a fixed calendar day. So understanding the Hebrew word translated in English is from, as we know it, is inclusive in the count, including, including Sunday as day one. So we understand that Hebrew word and the fact that though it is translated from Hebrew and English is from, we know the Hebrew word is inclusive. So you begin counting as day one that Sunday. That's day one. So some additional considerations. So what do we do when the first day of unleavened bread falls on a Sunday, when it falls on the first day of the week? Well, we believe that it, it's also the day of the wave sheaf offering when that occurs. This ensures that the wave sheaf is always offered on a Sunday and that it's always offered within the days of unleavened bread. And when you, when this rarely occurs, it happened to occur this year, by the way, and it'll occur again in 2022, that the years that that does occur, that at least you will be able to understand and appreciate that the wave sheaf was offered on a Sunday, and we still accept that, and that it's always offered within the days of unleavened bread, not after the days of unleavened bread have ended. So that's a very important principle. Again, that happens not every year, but it does occasionally happen. Some more additional considerations for many years, many of us in the ministry, and I'm guilty of this as well, have used the phrase that almost become like a cultural phrase, that we count 50 days from the Sabbath after the first day of unleavened bread. And that phraseology is not technically correct. The counting begins, as it's said there very clearly in Leviticus 23.15, from the day after the Sabbath. So our teaching is that Pentecost is counted starting with the Sunday, the first day of the week, during the days of unleavened bread, not from the Sabbath during the days of unleavened bread. And while it may seem to be a minor difference, referencing the Sabbath during unleavened bread has led to a lot of confusion and inaccuracy and has uh, led to some confusion on how to count 50 days during some years. So to be correct, what we are saying is that we begin counting Pentecost starting with not the Sabbath, the day after the Sabbath or from the Sabbath after the first day of unleavened bread, but it's counted starting with the Sunday, first day of the week during the days of unleavened bread. If you desire more information, if I haven't thoroughly confused you enough tonight and you really want to dig deep and get into this, there's uh, an entire 20 page doctrinal study paper called Pentecost and its observance and its incredible detail with footnotes and a lot of very good research. This was approved by the Council of Elders in September uh, 1997. And you can find that on the member site at UCG if you would like to download that and study it in more detail. So that's available for you as well. Okay, we try to go about 45 minutes or so with these uh, Bible studies and then open it up for anyone. If any of you have any particular questions on anything we covered tonight or um, anything that you just like to chat about or talk about this evening, we'd love to hear from you.